we have a discussion on regulating big tech companies. With the 2018 General Data Regulation, Protection Regulation, or GDPR, many people believe that the European Union has become the de facto global regulator of technology. One of the foremost voices in the EU on behalf of tech regulation is Maritja Schake. Maritja represented the Netherlands as a member of the European Parliament from 2009 to 2019, where she focused on trade, foreign policy, and technology, and she initiated the net neutrality law that's now in effect throughout Europe. Maritja is a member of the Transatlantic Commission on Election Integrity, the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace, and the European Council on Foreign Relations. I'm also really, really pleased to say that Maritja, as of this week, has joined Stanford University in a full-time capacity as High's inaugural International Policy Fellow. She's also jointly appointed at the new Cyber Policy Center at Stanford. Joining Maritza will be Eric Schmidt, who is technical advisor and board member to Alphabet. Eric joined Google in 2001 and served as CEO and executive chairman. Prior to Google, he was the CEO of Novell, chief technology officer at Sun Microsystems, and on the research staff at Xerox Palo Alto Research Center and Bell Laboratories. Maritza and Eric, the floor is yours. So what we thought we would do is uh, have me make a few comments and then have you make some comments and then have you lead Q&A on, on sort of everything we talk about, anything else the audience is interested in. I, I'm really delighted to be a member of the advisory board for the HAI. I think that uh, what Stanford is doing here is, is historic in many, many ways. And I'm reminded that ethics is a system of moral principles and that it's important that we debate now the ethics of what we're doing and that we debate now the impact that the technology that we're building is going to have on, on everything. So, so we're here fundamentally because we want to have an open debate, uh, not just for this stuff, but for the things that will be invented and so forth in the next five or 10 years. But we want to make sure that the systems that we're building are built on our values, on human values, right? Which is why this conference exists, it's why HAI exists, and it's why the research is so integrated. Um, a couple of updates of things that are going to happen fairly soon are that uh, I happen to be fortunate enough to be the chairman of a National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence which uh, will report its first report on November 5th in uh, DC at a big event uh, in the Congress. And it's a, this particular group was chartered by the Congress to look at AI, the impact of AI on society, national security, and so forth and so on. Um, a few days earlier, the Defense Innovation Board, of which I'm also the chairman, is hopefully going to debate and approve a proposal for the DOD ethics and the use of AI in ethical ways for the DOD. Uh, I, this is just a reminder that this work is ongoing, and I encourage you all to look at it and, and discuss it and, and give feedback. But, but my goal in those two initiatives is to sort of build a national consensus AI strategy for the US, where you know, roughly 30 countries already have these, right? but we don't seem to have one, and yet it's so central to what we do in universities, among our students, among our business, and for our nation. So, so one way to think about it is that in the last few years, we've gone from a relatively simple AI stack to a very complicated one. And this new AI stack, uh, which is a combination of deep learning and reinforcement learning, is extraordinarily powerful. And I want to give you some examples of some of the things that you can do and talk about the positive impacts of some of this on the thing I care a lot about now, which is science. And much of this work is going on here at Stanford. The, it's clear, and this is all published information, that we've already, with the current technology, which is largely labeled data and sophisticated vision algorithms, um, have detected lung cancer earlier. We can predict heart, um, heart attacks and strokes from your retina. Uh, we can detect the spread of breast cancer tumors uh, much earlier. This will save or help millions of people over the next five or 10 years as it deploys. This stuff works, it's done, it's in the bank, People are building companies and businesses and so forth around it. Google, for example, automatically captions one billion YouTube videos in 10 different languages, something which would be not economically possible. You can imagine the benefit of that to, to, to global diffusion of information. 
Um, and indeed, TensorFlow is now uh, open and, and, and very, very broadly used. I, I think folks here probably know that TensorFlow is a library which started off essentially as a, think of it as matrix multiplication, which is what tensors are. Um, but it's really a set of algorithms and procedures that do the powerful algorithms that I'm going to talk about. And it's been extended and, and so forth, and it's being used pretty much by everybody now. Um, and what's interesting about TensorFlow is that the extensions, and again, this is through open source and other partnerships, in say physics and statistics, which are recent libraries that have been added, are changing the way people think about using AI in these fields, right? It's a new way of solving a problem. Uh, this is new in the sense that this stuff wasn't available a year ago. These are the newest tools to do whatever it is that you care about. Um, and one of the things that Google did is we invented something called federated learning um, and popularized it and also open sourced it. And federated learning can be understood as allowing multiple computers to learn in pieces so that collectively you can do things faster and you can do things at scale and with certain kind of privacy pr protections. Now, Along the way, I had assumed that natural language processing was the sort of stepchild of all of this, and I couldn't have been wrong, more wrong. Um, and a team, again, from Google released a, a technique called BERT, which can be understood as the first really scalable self-supervision system. What it does, just so you understand, is it runs around and it learns from things like Wikipedia, um, and uh, books corpus and a few other things, and it self-trains. That's a very big deal. And much to my surprise, right, credit to the inventors of this, this self-training and based on that sort of rather disaggregated set of data has produced extremely interesting um, insights in terms of, I don't know, context and concepts in natural language, and we can use this in all sorts of new tasks. Uh, question answering and so forth and so on. A typical example is that you can take some words out and it'll put them back in. It figures all that stuff out. And it looks to me like NLP, which in my view had been sort of sitting around for a while, has now gotten a very significant boost by virtue of the BERT approach. And more importantly, I think it illustrates that there's much to do. That self-supervised learning, the notion of doing it on your own as a computer, is relatively new. Uh, most of the things and systems that you use today in AI have been with label data. And indeed, the examples that I use with you know, breast cancer and, and uh, vision and things like that uh, and healthcare are largely from label data. But there's a scale problem with labeling data and so forth. So, so with this, right, the combination of GANs, which I'll talk about in a sec, and reinforcement learning means that you really can begin to, to do things at scale that are sort of magical. Right. And that has a lot of implications for the things I'll talk about in a bit about ethics. So, so for me, w there is a set of questions that this begins to ask, and I'll begin to develop these by saying that we don't really understand today how humans and AI will coexist together. Right? I've given you very specific task-oriented examples, language understanding, vision, and so forth. But we don't fully understand how this interaction will Will deal, how people will deal with it. We don't have exactly the user interfaces. You know, 50 years ago, the Windows icons, menus, and pull-down interface was invented at Xerox PARC, and uh, we use that today without thinking about it. It had an enormous impact. What is the equivalent of that? It's obviously not going to be the WIMP interface from way back when. But how do we combine a human decision and an AI decision into this? So, so if you look at AI and speech and images, I would say that these, at least at the first pass, are solved problems. They're equal to or better than human capability, and that has a lot of implications. So for example, that's why self-driving cars make sense. It's just much better to have the car drive you rather than you because it doesn't get tired and it doesn't get drunk and it doesn't have accidents like you do. Um, and that's happening. Again, these are things which we know will happen. The question is what, what additionally will happen. So, We've made a lot of progress, for example, here with object recognition and so forth, but we have a lot of things that we're still working there. So, for example, true deep scene understanding, understanding for everyone, sort of low resource languages. There's lots of languages that aren't the ones that all of us speak. Um, true conversational handling of um, turns. It turns out that one of the hard research questions is how do you detect when a conversation goes from one person to another very back and forth quickly? I'm familiar with a research project 
which has as a thesis that the rate of such turns with a child, in terms of velocity of turns, is an indicator or perhaps driving their, uh, their intellectual development as a young child. This is at, at very young ages. We'll see if that's true, but it turns out it's hard to detect that. Right? So there's an example of where we are in that frontier. But to me, the thing that, that we're going to see now is the combination of the things I've talked about are going to transform science. And I want to give you some examples. So what happens in, in science is they have, and I now have talked to enough people to understand, they have an enormous amount of data that's very, very confusing. And if you look, pretty much all of the interesting AI approaches in science right now have a GAN in the middle of it. And for those of you that aren't familiar with GANs, GANs are where there's essentially two networks, one which is generating one, and one is which is approving or disapproving it. And because the two work together, eventually they can produce things which are, which are normalized right, and look similar to the underlying data. Pretty much any interesting application that I've seen in science has, as, has a GAN in the middle of it, which is trying to take all the sort of lossy data and the strange data and turn it into something which then can be manipulated. This, this hard science is about um, finding robust and reproducible patterns in this data. And so there is an opportunity where these models are very, very good at this. I had originally thought, when this was first presented to me, that somehow you just sort of run this stuff and it would figure it out. That's not true. It turns out you need much more sophisticated pipelines. This is the work that is going on at Stanford in research and many, many other places and you know, top universities in the country and so forth at Google and elsewhere. So when you add these generative models like GANs and then reinforcement learning, which uses a simulator, all of a sudden things go much faster. So anywhere where data is easily collected and then normalized, um, or where there's very little computational analysis in the field, which covers a fair amount of science, these things are appropriate. Now, the combination of these things will produce historic results. Uh, AlphaFold, which is from DeepMind, um, has just recently won one of the protein folding uh, competitions. The algorithm is essentially an energy management problem where you have to find the lowest energy state for a complicated set of uh, proteins as they, as, they, uh, as they move around and they fold. And this is computationally very, very difficult. And what it shows, and if you study AlphaFold as an example, that the generic solution is going to be something like this, that you'll take a data, the data into some sort of GAN, you'll get some sort of normalized data, and then you'll use reinforcement learning to discover a function that was not known to you before, a transformation of A to B. Um, where will this apply? Pretty much anywhere that's interesting and hard. Quantum chemistry, molecular binding, drug discovery, climate forecasting, complicated energy flows, uh, anything involving Navier-Stokes, those sorts of things. Why do I spend so much time talking about this? Because what happens when this technology in the next decade can allow us to build extraordinarily powerful new materials, right? to understand fundamentally what's going on with the climate in a way we didn't before, much more efficient energy generation. This is all good. This is really, really powerful. And I don't want us in these complicated debates about what we're doing to forget that the scientists here at Stanford and other places are making progress on problems which were thought to be unsolvable that have not been solved for 50 years or 100 years because they couldn't do the math at scale simply because of the way physics works. So I think that there's a set of issues, and then there's a set of really hard problems. And I'm going to define issues as ones which we can, I think, address fairly, relatively easily. Not easily, that's over an understatement. They can be addressed. So the, one of the first questions about AI systems is we want them to be in a situation where the end users are in control and they get what they want. Right. This is the problem of, you know, I built it and it didn't do what I wanted. And of course, movies are full of these scenarios. It's incredibly important that the AI systems that we collectively build, including the ones that I've highlighted and many others, have human control. Right? Our legal systems, our ethical systems, all are based on these sorts of principles. We don't want rogue things running around in, in the vernacular of movies. So, so how, do we, how do we get it so the end users that are using these systems have more control over them? And I mean more than like and dislike. How does that training actually work? Right? This is an area of extremely active research. Um, we, we just don't want uh, the AI just exploiting our impulses and obsessions and anxiety. Um, this is critical to the sustainable uh, adoption of AI. I'll give you another example, data. Many people, including myself, believe that if 
broadly speaking, healthcare data was broadly available, and we had the equivalent of ImageNet for healthcare data, uh, we would make enormous progress for diseases that have bedeviled humans since we've been around thousands of years. Um, we're not going to do that because it's a violation of privacy, it's not appropriate, and so forth and so on. So how do we solve that problem? How do we get to the point where we can get enough training data while respecting privacy? Right? Again, I'm not suggesting we, we do anything other than respect privacy. I think it's a fundamental ethical value. On the other hand, there really is a need, at least in the research community, to get this data to solve a disease. Right? And if you have the disease, all of a sudden your view of this gets very, very motivated. Um, and then how do you get access to the right data and to the right people in such a way that it's not misused? There's a lot of work here and elsewhere around bias. And um, an example of a contribution that Google has made is called ten something called TensorFlow Lattice. Um, it allows you to manage bi bias data. There's a tool, these are open source facets to understand it. There's something called model analysis to see the, uh, the data and what if to visualize the data right, in different forms of bias. We know the data has bias in it. Don't, you don't need to uh, yell that as a new fact. right? because humans have bias in them. Our systems have bias in them. It's like not a shock. The question is, what do we do about it? So at least at the current state of the art, we can help you understand the, the bias and identify it. The real question to me is that an ethical matter, how do you address it? Another thing that's important, and I think we're getting there as an industry, is, is I'm going to say this is good judgment is required. Uh, two examples. Um, in Google's case, we've been very, very careful about sensitive things like face recognition uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, if you look at OpenAI, which is essentially a partner with Google in many of these things, um, they withheld the public details of GPT-2, which is a text service that generated arbitrary text, um, and they allowed it for research use, but they didn't publish it, so they didn't want it to be misused. These are two examples of good judgment and I think there's going to be more such examples, and it's important that we establish the basis for that good judgment and that the people who are doing this sort of really think about it before they sort of release these things. I mentioned before the issue of control. This is a subject of research issue as well as, as sort of uh, academic, academic interest and, and business interest. You really need to know, right, that in the corner cases of these algorithms, nothing weird happens. There's a great deal of interest in China. I think the China problem is solvable with the following insight. We need access to their top scientists, right? We are better off collectively when their top scientists, the incredible talent that is there and in other countries, is here in our country working on these things. Um, and we also benefit from common frameworks, uh, TensorFlow being an example, and there are a number of other ones. And I would argue that even in a situation where everybody hates each other among all the countries and they can't get along and they don't agree on anything, there are still areas of common agreement. The most obvious one is you have a country that's doing experiments. Let's say it has some horrific cyber thing that it's experimenting with, um, not the US, but somebody else. And clearly, it's not in their interest or in our interest for this to escape from its testing harness. Right? You are, so there are all sorts of ways and imagine, you can imagine treaties and agreements among countries to try to mitigate the worst possible scenarios, the one that everybody wants to talk about. I think there's some really hard issues. Um, I think this fake video thing and the impact of misinformation is a really hard issue. It's hard at a sociological level. It's hard at a technical level. Google made a data set of visual fakes for detection for the research community following one with uh, uh, one involving text. And for, excuse me, for synthetic speech. This is a case where the researchers have to win. It's important that we develop techniques to detect these things and to be able to handle them. We don't want a world which is nothing but misinformation, where everybody is an audience of one and where everything is marketed to by some evil government in some other country and so forth, all of the scenarios that we talk about. It's important that the technology that we have invented be used in a way that increases trust, increases ethical use of information, and doesn't dumb it down. I'm very worried about uh, the issues of deterrence. So uh, I'm, I'm good friends with a number of people who uh, worked hard to make the world that we, are, we have now safe from nuclear weapons. And when you talk to them about how they did deterrence and how they did all of the negotiations at the time,
Um, and these are heroes, in my view, because we're all alive, basically, because of the work that they did. Um, they, they talk about the scarcity of the weapons and the, the ability to count them and the ability to sort of know what others were doing. And often, one of the techniques would be that one side would tell the other what they knew. Well, none of these principles apply in what I would imagine would be software negotiations for many, many reasons. Software is, is diffuse. You wouldn't tell the other side what you had done. I mean, I, I, again, I'm making these things up in my own mind. But we haven't had a proper um, regime around how all of that works. So if you have the Secretary of State of one country and the Secretary of State of another country having this conversation, what are the ground rules? And it's pretty clear, by the way, that because AI is incredibly powerful, um, that there will be negative issues. There will be negative uses. I'm not arguing against that. So how do you talk about it? Does one side disclose it to the other? Well, no one would naturally do that. What are the norms of this? This area strikes me as one which is an, a nascent beginning, but likely to become very important um, as general intelligence becomes more and more possible, which is some time from now, of course. Um, when this technology, another hard issue is the technologies that I'm talking about will largely first come out in government form or in commercial form. So for example, in China, the surveillance uh, technology, uh, which is as a technical matter well done, has had a, a sort of terrible impact, right? So that's the first use that those folks have seen of the power of AI. Well, that's not the first use I would like them to see of AI. How do we sort that out? Um, this notion of sort of ubiquity of this technology and how do people experience it will also color how our technology is treated. And I think it's also important that we establish right here, right now, that the liberal values of Stanford and of the university and Western values are the ones that should win, right? That we shouldn't allow other values, right? Which we can debate what they are specifically, but we need to be unified and clear on that. So there are lots and lots of upcoming issues. My, my favorite current one is the following. So in the, in the reasonable future, not in the next year or two, it'll be possible for you, let's say you're a, a somewhat into middle age kind of an adult and you're kind of bored with your normal life. And so what you do is you put a headset on for the day and you live a life of your younger self. And that virtual world that you live in is populated with the virtual images of your friends who are themselves younger, more handsome, more beautiful, more energetic, richer, whatever, uh, more, more hip. What do you think about that? What do you think about, um, uh, the term I use there is called crossing over, right? What do you think about people who would choose to do that? Is that a good thing or a bad thing as they sort of leave our current physical world except for things like eating, right, and they go into that? Now, is that a likely scenario? Take a look at 3D gaming today and imagine 10 years from now. You can do this with many, many different technologies, and we need to start having those debates. What I want to say here in finishing up is that um, this, I start from the premise that this technology is extraordinarily beneficial. I think the evidence is there. The ability to deal with disease alone, right, which has bedeviled all of us and our ancestors and our parents and our children and so forth and so on. I mean, what a gift, and I can go on. Think of the number of people who will be alive because a car doesn't kill them. I mean, I can just go on and on and on and on. Um, I also think that we're just beginning to see the impact of this technology on the really, really powerful things in science, right? whether it's disease discovery, understanding how the basics of energy work, and so forth and so on. And we will see that benefit in the same sense that we saw the benefit of electricity you know, 100 years later. I think that the optimism that I would offer for a research perspective is that I think we know what the next set of things are, right? That the combination of the GANs that I talk, talked about, um, this sort of self-supervised learning maneuvers, reinforcement learning, and the development of broad simulators, or at least specific simulators, will enable these extraordinary gains in the next five years. I cannot wait to see what next year and the following year look like from the power of what is happening here. So thank you very much. Would you like to go ahead? Thank you.
Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk about governance. We can see if it's a problem or an issue, uh, one of the two. It's certainly a hot topic. Um, earlier this week, I was doing a debate in New York organized by Intelligence Squared where the proposition was in an Oxford-style debate, Europe has declared war on the American tech companies. And I was kind of wishing that the debate would have taken place one week later because then the proposition might have been American Congress has declared war on the American tech companies. So in that light, you know, merely talking about regulating big tech already sounds like an olive branch. But very clearly, in Europe and the United States, and frankly globally, questions of governance to safeguard the rule of law, the public interest, and the protection of indiv individual rights, collective rights, amidst technological change and geographical power shifts, is at the top of the agenda. I think the biggest question is how do we implement regulation? And I would say starting with principles that we protect for very, very good reason is a much more productive approach than to suggest that techno technologies are so exceptional that they can only be regulated by entirely new systems or models. Firstly, we don't have the time or really the ability to start from scratch if there if ever is such an opportunity in governing, but especially now in these polarized times and global, uh, globally tense times, I think uh, it is just not going to work that way. But more importantly, there's too much that is of enormous value in the human rights frameworks and other fundamental principles that we have uh, to simply discard them. Now, an often heard argument, especially in this part of the world, is that governments should refrain from regulating technology or the internet because it would stifle innovation. Maybe this sounds familiar. But I think the zero-sum dichotomy is a caricature. In fact, arguing that implies that innovation is more important than democracy or the rule of law, the foundations of our quality of life. And I believe actually, that some of the most serious challenges to our open societies, but also to the open internet today, do not stem from over, but rather under regulation of technologies. Now, the idea that tech companies are categorically against regulation is paradoxical for many reasons, because they have directly and also significantly benefited from regulations, such as Section 230, intermediary liability exemptions. And actually, companies themselves are increasingly governing very impactful parts of our economies, societies, and democracies. Terms of use are often a stronger indicator than legal articles of what hundreds of millions of people experience in terms of content when they go online. Google processes approximately 63,000 searches a second. Verizon and MasterCard verify your identity and payments online. Uber knows your every move. Microsoft is now going to build the Defense Department's cloud, while Facebook decides who can and cannot be trusted as a news source. There is a lot of power in the hands of very few actors. And not only does that make it very difficult for newcomers to catch up in terms of creating data volumes, private companies are increasingly taking over crucial parts and the role of governments, uh, but without an explicit mandate and without democratic legitimacy, without the kind of uh, accountability that's proportionate to the powers that they assume. So I believe principally, and I really look forward to being part of that debate here at Stanford, we need a deeper debate about which tasks need to stay in the hands of the public, out of the market. I think about questions around currency, defensive but also offensive capabilities, critical infrastructure, personal data, identity, including your own genetic structures. We need to talk about what should be in the public, not in the market. Now, when the internet was designed and shared, many had hoped and even hinted that access to it as such would harbor and spread democracy, and others thought that the internet would actually technically be ungovernable. I think we must look at what we've learned from the promise of the open internet and where we are today in practice. I'm sure you will all remember the famous words by John Perry Barlow in his Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace. I quote, we are forming our own social contract. This governance will arise according to the conditions of our world, not yours. Our world is different. We are creating a world where anyone 
anywhere may express his or her beliefs, no matter how singular, without fear of being coerced into silence or conformity. Your legal concepts of property, expression, identity, movement, and context do not apply to us. This was around 20 years ago in Davos. And I often think back uh, about the echo of John Perry Barlow's words as a bit of a reality check when I hear evangelists about artificial intelligence, but also blockchain, which kind of is more in the background now, it seems. But the notion or the suggestion that there is no time to lose or that in a G2 world, a race to AI dominance will determine geopolitical relations for a decade to come. Now, on the significance of AI, I, I don't disagree, but the question is not merely who dominates, but very much the question of which values and principles will be underpinning this kind of power and leadership. Certainly, a race for AI power must not be an excuse for a race to the bottom where innovation, efficiency, or competition trump the safeguarding of public interests, fair competition, human rights, or democratic principles. And then this is a question that really has me thinking a lot these days. If AI benefits disproportionately from an undemocratic and centrally governed model such as the one we see in China, but also other parts of the world, where data can be massively hoovered up without much restriction and where human rights are not respected, and if AI in turn will make that undemocratic government more powerful, why do we have such high expectations of what this technology will bring us, especially if we don't have the proper rules, checks and balances? And if AI is not inherently an accelerator of top-down control, we need to look at governance and regulation even more ambitiously. I believe that if we want to preserve democracy, we need to democratize the way in which we govern technology itself. And it's a little ironic to put it mildly that the same companies that are warning against the dominance of Chinese standards are in fact sending data to Beijing themselves. I heard Mark Zuckerberg warning lawmakers on Capitol Hill for China as the alternative to Facebook's proposed Libra currency. But the company has data sharing partnerships with four Chinese companies, including Huawei. And you cannot imagine, during the 10 years that I spent in European Parliament, how often I heard from tech lobbyists, do not regulate us because otherwise China, dot, dot, dot. They will use our laws as a legitimation of theirs. And we can safely conclude right now that that argument has not led to successful outcomes for democracies so far. Inaction to regulate by democracies has not stopped Chinese leaders from instrumentalizing tech, mirroring communist values and political mo models. In fact, the asymmetry in governance becomes ever larger when democratic countries from re refrain from ensuring a values and rules-based framework that creates benchmarks to protect principles such as the freedom of expression, access to information, non-discrimination, fair competition, presumption of innocence, and when we do not develop a vision for our relation to developing economies and trade relations as AI also impacts data flows across the world. We see China using technology as an extension of its governance model that is increasingly global, while the US mainly lets technology and thus business models speak for themselves except, and I find this interesting uh, and puzzling sometimes, except when it comes to national security, which always seems the exception for Americans when they do see a significant role for government. European privacy laws should be seen as an intention to protect people from government intrusion as much as overreach by private companies. Since World War II, the rules-based order was seen as a key priority for Western democracies, from trade to human rights, from democracy to, trade, uh, to war and peace norms. And for norms to have meaning, they need to be enforceable and violators held to account. So we need more guarantees and institutions, processes, than just stated good intentions of what I used to call uh, in the European Parliament, scouts honor, you know, when companies say, we, we promise we're really 
going to do good. Um, and I'm not even sure that, that such explicit intentions are made anymore. Um, I don't know if do no evil is still Google's motto, um, but it's really about more than promises. We heard about the need for redistribution of, of benefits, for example, in the first panel. Now, you know, which government would say, okay, if that's your intention, uh, big tech company, that's fine, go ahead. Or do we need taxation and other kinds of redistribution mechanisms that apply equally in place? Uh, I would say we do. But what we can see so far is that in part led by the success of Silicon Valley businesses and its culture, the US took a more libertarian approach and certainly did not seek to build and safeguard a rules-based order in the digital sphere, uh, or let's say an internet whole and at peace. And we now know that this hands-off approach did not break monopolies, but created new ones, empowered not only individuals, but also companies and dictators disrupted journalism and electoral processes, and did not prevent the balkanization of the internet. It certainly did not nudge China into following our example. And I've not mentioned explicitly inequality, discrimination, job displacement, and the environmental damage that we also have to be very mindful of and that AI can put on steroids. And I'm very glad Joy is here. Uh, we'll he hear from her later because she will talk about some of the uh, risks of exacerbating discrimination um, that can happen when data that is being put into the training of algorithms and AI is biased or flawed uh, for many reasons. But because digitization often means privatization, it means that the outsourcing of governance to tech companies, technologies and algorithms built for profit, efficiency, competitive advantage, time spent online, ads sold, certainly not uh, designed to safeguard or strengthen democracy, is a process that's happening. I believe that the shift to private and opaque governance through technological standards is one of the most significant consequences of AI that we need to shed more light on. Laura Lessig's work, Code is Law, is in that sense more relevant than ever. But the reality is, and for lawmakers this is an inconvenient truth, is that the full impact of the massive use of tech platforms and AI remains largely unknown. Academics, regulators, law enforcement, lawmakers, judges, civil society, journalists, and citizens alike have an information deficit compared to companies, even if their impact is public for both good, and we've heard a lot about opportunities, but also harmful. And also companies may look at the same data through a completely different lens and with the aim of achieving completely different goals than uh, the, sta uh, the um, uh, stakeholders that I mentioned um, may have. And actually many AI engineers will admit that no person really knows anymore where the head and the tail of algorithms are after endless iterations. They're excited about the fact that outcomes are not predictable and I can understand that excitement. But we can only know what the unintended outcomes are when we know what was intended in the first place. When there's transparency of training data and documentation of intended outcomes and variations of algorithms. And on top of that, regulators and auditors, as well as other public servants, will need to get mandates and capacity for meaningful access to data and information. I think the example of Cambridge Analytica is interesting. It is often seen as an abuse of Facebook's platform, but I believe it actually simply used the platform the way that was possible without restrictions on data collection, micro-targeting, data sharing, and the use of political advertisements. The same goes for multiple other disinformation campaigns. So in assessing all the possibilities and opportunities that AI offers, as well as its potential harm, we must explicitly look both at use and abuse, the intended and the unintended. But the Cambridge Analytica scandal anecdotally shows how huge the accountability gap is. And we see this with every data breach or cyber attack over and over again, because too often no one faces meaningful consequences. Without transparency, no accountability,
and a real risk of disenfranchisement of citizens who see powerless public authorities in the face of very powerful events happening and impacting their lives. Now, trade secrets and other intellectual property protections cannot be the perpetual shield against meaningful access to information and oversight. It's a fairly cynical cycle where companies claim that politicians don't know anything about technology so that so, you know, they can only but propose bad regulations and laws when in fact the most important information is carefully guarded. This cycle has to be broken. And if trade secrets stands between us and scrutiny, that has to change. Another argument I often hear is it's too early to regulate artificial intelligence. But at the same time, many people agree that we were too late to regulate platform companies, micro-targeting, political ad data protection and privacy online. And you know, perhaps the timing is never perfect, but I would prefer to be proactive and not wait until there are further uh, harms or, or uh, other effects of AI. And, and let's, let's be proactive while we can be. Now, this conference will deal a lot with ethics frameworks, and it's, it's a very popular topic. It's also hard to be against ethics, I believe. And that may explain that there are now around 128 frameworks of AI and ethics in Europe alone. But if everything is ethics, nothing is. And the question is, who design, designs and oversees ethics standards? Who decides what is or who is an ethically competent leader? And what happens in cases of breach? In other words, how do we make sure that it is meaningful and enforceable and not just window dressing and a distraction? AI development should promote fairness and justice, protect the rights and interests of stakeholders and promote equality of opportunity. AI should promote green development and meet the requirements of environmental friendliness and resource conservation. AI systems should continuously improve transparency, explainability, reliability and controllability, and gradually achieve auditability, supervisability, traceability and trustworthiness. I can go on, there's a fairly long list and it's interesting because I was reading from principles of AI governance and responsible AI produced by the National New Generation of Artificial Intelligence Governance Expert Committee in China. This was produced on June 17th, 2019. And I wanna thank uh, Laurent Lascaille and Graham Webster from New America because they made available uh, the translation. I think it's, it's worth a read because when you read these ethics principles, they sound quite accessible and agreeable, but clearly uh, they have not quite solved the challenges between, for example, this country uh, and China. And I personally believe we can, we can do with more focus on the rule of law uh, than on ethics and on empowering the institutions we have to perform the tasks of regulating antitrust, the handling of personal data, net neutrality, the application of media laws online, consumer rights, safety and technical standards, et cetera, et cetera. Again, we don't have to start from scratch. And this is not about regulating the internet or regulating against big tech companies, this is about preserving principles, standards, and values, no matter what technological disruption. It's certainly unrealistic to assume a sort of broad societal and political trust in artificial intelligence, especially after so much trust has been lost by tech companies and in failed self-regulation efforts. I think it's difficult for companies to want to have it both ways. While on the one hand making big promises to customers or advertisers about the extraordinary efficiency with which ads can be connected to internet users. And on the other hand, when you say, well, we have to start thinking about the potential harms of machine learning to say, oh, you know, we're not that far yet. Uh, AI is really in its early stages. Um, one of the things that continues to puzzle me is how companies like YouTube or Facebook can turn over billions because of the ever more precise way it handles all the information gathered. And it doesn't come much further than we're very sorry for mistakes we made and we have a lot of learning to do. When you ask them about the very scandals and we have too many to tap into here to really talk about what happened and how we can prevent them in the future. And I've mentioned Facebook a couple of times. Uh, I know they're under a lot of scrutiny, but just because they're visibly targeted now doesn't mean that they're the only company that is doing these kinds of things. I frankly think that this kind of naivety stands in no proportion to the power 
tech companies have, and with great power should come great responsibility, or at least modesty. Some of the outcomes of pattern recognition or machine learning are reason for such serious concerns that pauses are justified. And I don't think that everything that's possible should also be put in the wild or into society as part of this often quoted race for dominance. We need to actually answer the question collectively, how much risk are we willing to take? Here too, we don't have to start from scratch. In Europe, we have a principle called the precautionary principle. And the idea is that, for example, when you look at GMOs or new medicines and other innovations where the impact could potentially be huge, but the societal risks are still unclear, that you wait a moment and research further before it is, for example, standardized or uh, licensed. And it's, it's always ridiculed, uh, especially by Americans, as unscientific, which uh, recently it was discovered that two years after a big announcement of the success of a, a genetically manipulated cow, it turned out that during the gene editing process, bacteria that also caused antibiotic resistance uh, entered into this cow, uh, and it was found out two years later scientifically discovered, I should say. So sometimes time helps, uh, and especially when risk is, is significant, uh, time and a bit of uh, pause, I think, is, is not ill-advised. At least, there should be systematic impact assessments, parallel learning processes in the public interest when AI is developed. For example, when data cannot be anonymized or is very easily re-identifiable, we should limit the use until that problem is sorted or if facial recognition systems are irreconcilable with the right to privacy, then there is a legitimate ground to ban its use, not only by governments, but also by companies, because we know how easily technologies proliferate and we don't want to create more asymmetry between governments and companies here. Now, Rob said it, um, the EU has adopted a number of regulations, uh, causing some to call it a super regulator, which when I was uh, in, in the midst of it, it didn't always feel that way when the sausage was being made. But uh, certainly, uh, I think it is very, very good to take the approach when regulating to see internet users not as products or consumers, but as citizens. And the general data protection regulation will hopefully also lead to, for example, higher standards of data for artificial intelligence development, as well as to data protection. We have net neutrality, cybersecurity laws that are steps in the right direction. I was not personally as happy with the new copyright directive. Um, and there's multiple challenges that Europe still faces. For example, without growth, um, it will be very difficult to actually set standards on the basis of these uh, agreed principles and, and values. And I think this is where the EU really has to step up. Meanwhile, we see development where in the US there is a catching up on the notion of regulation. San Francisco, interestingly very close to where these technologies are developed, uh, has banned facial recognition uh, as, as to be used by uh, the government. Um, Uber and Lyft drivers can no longer just be seen as independent workers. California has a privacy bill and the hearing of Mark Zuckerberg looked like serious um, grilling. Um, I think it is interesting why some companies do and other companies don't uh, appear before hearings. Um, but in any, in any case, such hearings, even though they're quite spectacular and it's very important that lawmakers get the questions that they want answered, they can't substitute regulation and laws. So concluding, uh, I see a clear momentum now between the EU and the US, significant part of the thankfully democratic parts of the world, where we can catch up to fill the regulatory gaps for platforms and other digital service and anticipating the broader use of artificial intelligence. I'm convinced the question is not whether there will be regulations, but who sets the rules. And I hope that between the US and the EU, but with partners like Japan, hopefully India, we can build and develop a democratic governance model for technology and AI. And here I think it's very clear that tech companies cannot stay on the fence in taking a position in relation to values and rights. I personally believe that a rules-based order serves the public interest, 
as well as individual and collective rights and liberties that companies benefit from, but that everybody has a role to play to also contribute to the common interest and to strengthen the resilience of our democracies. Thank you.